This is Twit. So we've been following this right to repair movement for some mm. time, and it's interesting. It's, some of it is people who have iPhone screens, they want to get replaced by third parties or do it themselves. But a lot of it, believe it or not, is coming from the heartland, from farmers, because they have tractors. John Deere acts like your tractor is a sealed box. Mm -hmm. You can't make repairs to it. If a third party makes repairs to it before you're allowed to use it, you have to bring it to John Deere and get it certified. And considering the amount of money they pay for this hardware, you'd, you'd think Hugely you'd actually expensive. have the ability. And if one sensor goes out and then the whole thing stops and all it's doing is create, you know, collecting data, then it's, it's the easiest thing in the world for the farmer to come down and actually say, right, okay, I'll just disconnect that, and then the next time the repairman comes around, he can put... They're turning surgery. them into hackers! Yeah. Joining us tonight, right now, um, a man who knows about it, and by the way, I gotta thank you, Jason, is it Kebler? It's Kebler, yes. Kebler. Editor-in-chief of Motherboard, uh, Motherboard of Vice Publication, you are doing such a good job. That is, I go there every day. Your stuff on Motherboard is fantastic, so thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, yeah, that you're means doing a lot. A, a really great job. Uh, also from iFixit, we've met her before, Kelsey Weber. Uh, and the reason we have iFixit on is because that's been iFixit's uh, kind of MO all along. You wanted to be the repair manual for the internet. Yeah, teaching everybody how to fix everything means, you know, eliminating barriers to repair. So um, yeah. we're hoping that right to repair legislation will help us do that. We're crossing our fingers. So, Jason, yeah. you've been covering these hacking farmers, tractor hacking cool, farmers. Right? <laughs> is this, yeah. what's going on? Is this, is this really a movement? It is a movement, yeah. So there are a lot of P uh, farmers who have been finding pirated versions of John Deere Service Advisor on like Pirate Bay or these different pay forums that are out there, um, putting it on their laptops and flashing it to their tractors in order to, uh, you know, replace different parts. So as you mentioned, you know, if uh, if you try to do a repair uh, and you don't have this software, it's the parts come essentially brain dead. So um, farmers have been calling out like dealers to come fix things that in the past they could have done in like five minutes. And it's taking the dealers, you know, sometimes a few hours, sometimes a few weeks uh, to be able to get out to, you know, a rural farm. What's the rationale? Why does it, how does John Deere justify this? Uh, I mean, they say that these are sophisticated pieces of machinery, which they are to, you know, their credit. Um, but basically every part of a tractor now has software on it, has a sensor. Um, they say, you know, the, the uh, software helps it stay within EPA compliance, uh, you know, and they basically say that you need an authorized person to be able to fix these things. Are they, are they worried about piracy? Uh, they're more worried about like modif modifications of the tractor. So there are farmers out there who are, uh, you know, hacking in and souping up the tractors to have a higher horsepower or something uh, like that. Uh, they're the overclocking their well, tractor. In the same way people do with cars, tractors. yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is like an American tradition, like tinker with your stuff, yeah. soup it up, buy it. Um, but John Deere makes a ton of money from its authorized repair services and its dealers. And so... Uh, it wants to have a monopoly on repair, essentially. Isn't it also making a ton of money out of the data that uh, that it collects oh. when it's doing it in terms of soil soil consistency and, and that sort of thing, and then it's selling that on to other people? I can't talk, like, deeply on that because I haven't, like, delved into that world. Um, but there is, like, uh, a lot of farmers are very suspicious that their data is yeah. being used uh, to, you know, make money either by John Deere or like other third-party platforms. And I think it's definitely a, little, a legitimate concern. You have to understand though that, I mean, when I think John Deere, I think of a, my riding mower. Some of these devices are living rooms on wheels. Some mm -hmm. of these combines, in fact, we have a listener who actually listens to all our shows while he's out in the fields in his combine because it basically is like an office, like a living room, it's, it's highly computerized. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to do much. It's following the rows. It's doing all this stuff. So this is, I mean, it's not a car. This is heavily software driven. So it, 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 to understand this, you have to understand it's a lot more than just, oh, yeah. you know, souping up your, your 56 Dodge. Yes. No, I mean, it's sort of back in our grandfather's day, you could fix a tractor with a spanner and a, a large hammer generally, but <laughs> these days, you know, it's it's so much more complicated and so much more involved with, with the software side of things. But if people have always tinkered, and I can't help feeling if you bought this, this piece of hardware at an amazing price, you should have the ability to just, you know, sort it out yourself if needs be. How much are these tractors, Jason? I mean, how expensive is it? Some of them are like $300,000. Okay. So that's another big problem because a lot of them are essentially bought on layaway or like You, do, you don't own them. John Deere owns them. 
John Deere owns them. They yeah. license them to you. You spend the next 20 years, you know, paying, making a monthly payment on it and you have to sign a licensing agreement and that licensing agreement is very strict. Um, and if you violate it, which, uh, you know, hacking into the tractor does violate the licensing agreement, John Deere can sue you. So, um, that's p where this, uh, political movement comes in. Um, the hope is that we can get legislation passed or these farmers, the people involved in the movement can get legislation passed, uh, at a state level that would uh, essentially bar uh, these sorts of terms from licensing agreements. It would also require uh, John Deere and Apple and Microsoft and all uh, electronics companies to sell replacement parts as well as make service manuals available. Well, that's Kelsey, that's what you yeah. and I fix it have been lobbying for. That's what you do. You, you are the repair manuals for the internet. You're, you don't have John Deere tractor repair manuals, though, right? We've got some tractor repair no. manuals up oh, on the site. Sweet. Yeah, we no do. Kidding. We've got, um, and those have been contributed from um, some people in our local area. But the right to repair legislation and movement isn't anything new. If you um, look back to 2012, similar laws were passed in Massachusetts um, when it came to um, automotive repair. So I'm um, requiring uh, manufacturers and dealerships to share repair information, diagnostic information, and parts and tools with independent repair shops. So that was back in 2012. It became a national policy in 2014. So it only took one state to make this happen. And so now we're asking for something similar when it comes to electronics. We just want the repair info and we want um, replacement parts to be made available to owners and um, independent professionals. Well, that makes sense. I mean, if you... Put, you know, <laughs> wait, wait, what was that? Was that a wooden iPod? Yeah. <laughs> That's something that Apple doesn't want you to do. I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you right now. But might, hey, you know, you bought it, you own it. A lot of this your, comes well, down to ownership exactly. rights. Yeah, yeah I mean, and um, I think that you know, John John Deere. A lot of these companies are trying to protect their intellectual property, but you can protect your IP and still allow people to have access right. to repair and maintain the things that they bought and own. So um, and, yeah. the D, and the DMCA complicates this enormously in terms of from from a legislative position in terms of whether or not people can actually tinker around with their you own You can't stuff reverse as well. engineer copy protected uh, software, for instance, and, and that's what you need to do to do this kind of thing. This is the customer bill of rights on uh, iFix's uh, site. And I completely agree, although I'm a little sympathetic if John Deere owns the tractor. One of the things that, that worries me, and Jason, you report on this, is that a lot of the hacked firmware comes from places like Ukraine. Hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, at least according to the farmers and according to like the metadata in the software, um, it looks like these uh, service advisor was basically hacked either in Ukraine or Russia and then sold back. So that raises um, issues in my mind in terms of security, privacy, we all know how reliability. In Ukraine can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is something that's come up a lot, um, and it's something that hasn't happened yet. But people are talking. You know, um, if this software is on a lot of uh, tractors all over the country and they have the ability to basically kill them remotely like what does that mean for food security what does it mean for um right. like yeah this industry and i don't think you know it's necessarily like a piracy issue there it's also the fact that john deere does not want people looking into this closed source software at all so right. there's not mm -hmm. a whole lot of like security researchers looking into like uh, looking for bugs and looking for zero days in, in tractors. Well, you're not going to get Ed Felton or anybody in the United States to do it because, you know, they don't want to run afoul of the law. On the yeah. other hand, uh, there are a lot of very, very talented programmers in uh, for the former Soviet Union and in, in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, people who uh, know how to do this stuff, or, and they don't have to worry about U.S. law and U.S. regulation. So I'm actually not surprised. We, I know some, there's some very good software companies in Ukraine. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the Russia put an enormous amount of money into training up computer specialists. Right. And then uh, they didn't have any jobs. Yeah. 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 So some of them turned to hacking, but some of them turned to creating good software. So I don't want to impugn... Just because these these uh, this firmware is coming out of Ukraine, but mm. at I don't, at the same time, it's legitimate cause for concern. So it's pretty we don't have an open source tractor movement in a way, but it's um, I is guess there is there anything like that, Jason? An open source? Yeah. Movement? So I I hadn't heard about it, but then after we published this piece, a bunch of people started tweeting at me, and there is a like very nascent movement oh, um, to oh, have excellent. open source tractor software. Um, obviously, the barrier to entry for creating like a tractor is much higher than probably even the barrier to entry for like a computer or something like that. Like these are serious uh, pieces of equipment. They're three hundred thousand dollars a piece. Like you're not going to have some startup suddenly selling like 
easily repairable tractors. And that's one of the problems. Like people say, oh, just buy a different tractor, just buy a different phone. But, uh, you know, Case New Holland does this as well, as do the other, like Caterpillar has the same problem. So uh, it's not as easy as just like voting with your wallet. You had an amazing story, Jason, I think it was last year, uh, about a legislator, state legislator in Nebraska, I think it was, where they were trying to do right to repair legislation. And Apple actually tried to, it looked like trying to bribe them. Well, yeah, I mean, so it was, I, I don't know if we'd say, call it a bribe. It, I think it's just standard lobbying, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's lobbying. There's like a thin a line level. between lobbying and bribing, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> America has legitimized bribery and just called it lobbying fees. You know? yeah. So I what mean, happened? Can say that. You guys can say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, someone showed up in uh, this legislator's office and said, if you guys pass this legislation, Nebraska will become a, quote, mecca for hackers, which is like, what? Bizarre. It's a bizarre thing to say. And, uh, you know, Apple and other companies have threatened some of these smaller states like Vermont is also considering, um, you know, right to repair legislation. They've threatened to basically pull out of those states entirely. And you have these state lawmakers who are saying, like, a Apple doesn't do any business in Nebraska. Like it sells its products in Nebraska, but there's uh, maybe like one or two Apple stores in all of Nebraska. It's not like a big um, employer mm. there. <laughs> and so... Uh, who, what is a big employer there are these like small independent repair right. shops that would really benefit from this legislation. So, yeah. um, you know, they have sort of like big wigs from Cupertino and DC flying in and they're like, what are you guys doing here? I would bet Kelsey, it's not just Nebraska that uh, how many states currently are considering right to repair legislation? So this, this year we've got 17 states, wow. um, that have introduced bills, which is, which is huge. It's, um, the most this year so far. So, um, and each uh, bill is a little bit different depending on um, who's sponsoring the bill in that state. But um, but really, this is just such an important thing for consumers and consumers, um, you know, choice. You know, the, uh, we are we'll be able to allow consumers to either um, choose to fix it themselves, take it to that local repair shop, or bring it back to the manufacturer in case they have a warranty that they want to go ahead and use. It also helps people save money; they're not being forced into upgrading or forced to paying um, high prices that the manufacturers typically charge for repair. And um, you know, I always come on when I'm talking about teardowns and talk about e-waste. This is right. anything that yeah. we can do to prolong the lifespan of these devices is, is going to keep them out of the landfills and also create jobs in the process. You know, with all these electronics, um, it's we can't just depend on manufacturers to um, fix all of our things. And we can't leave um, the control with them in a sense, because like we saw with these farmers, they're waiting for John Deere to come out and approve these repairs. And right now with the app iPhone battery gate, we have millions of people that are waiting for um, battery replacements from Apple instead of just going ahead and doing it themselves or, you know, going to uh, a local repair shop. So um, we can't just, uh, you know, I bought it, I own it. I don't want, it, it almost makes me feel like there's a bit of a control over how I'm communicating and like with my livelihood in a sense, because all these things are going to break. And if I have to wait on the manufacturer to dictate, you know, how and when it's going to get fixed, then that impacts, you know, my daily life um, in a number of ways. So, yeah, it's important to get these things passed uh, for consumer rights. A PC guy in our chat room is reminding me that there was a YouTuber who showed how to do board level repairs, micro soldering and oh, things on, yeah. a, on MacBooks and Apple basically shut him down. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I do, I, I do have to be fair. I understand a little bit why John Deere might... See, look, we've talked before about uh, jailbreaking an iPhone, for instance, right. and then how risky that is. And I don't recommend you jailbreak an iPhone. I think it's your right... I guess it's your right to do it. You own the device. That's the nub of it for me. It's You bought it. You know, you, you have the right to do what you like with but it. But if you aren't... If you're if you're you don't really own that John Deere tractor, you're paying it off over time. With a tractor, that's the yeah. And it's the, potentially going to destroy that thing or cause security issues. Uh, Jason, I, I, mean, I feel like if if there is legislation, it needs to take into account everybody who's a stakeholder. And John Deere and Apple are stakeholders in this. Hmm. But if yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, you raise a good point. I think. You know, if you are paying a monthly fee to John Deere to use the tractor, it's their tractor. But yeah. if you bought it like wholesale, you should be able to do whatever you want with it. I think that's sort of where I come down on it. I think it's like, you know, if you own it, you should be able to do whatever you want. I like I have yeah. an iPhone. Uh, I don't jailbreak it because I think, you know, there are many like pros and cons to jailbreaking it. You can't even jailbreak the new ones, actually. But um, I think, yeah, it's like 
if I buy it, I should be able to do whatever I want with it. And if I mess it up, that's on me. And, you know, Apple doesn't have to service my phone, for instance. I actually have like a quick story uh, if you guys. Sure. Want to hear. But uh, I bought a 2017 iMac last year and I upgraded the RAM in it. Uh, worked great for, you know, a couple months. I did it myself. Um, and then suddenly the screen went dark one day. Uh, I need a new screen, a new uh, 4K screen. I must have done something wrong. I don't know. Uh, Apple will not fix my uh, iMac at all, which is, you know, it's their prerogative. They won't fix it. But I took it to a an independent repair shop that said, sure, we can fix it, no problem, but there's no screen. We can't get a screen. Because so Apple doesn't sell parts. Yeah. Apple doesn't sell parts. It's been sitting at that repair shop for four months. Oh, like I, it's, it's just like I'm out of luck, you know? And, um, you know, you can call me an idiot. Maybe I am for, like, botching that repair. But Apple makes, you know, millions upon millions of these screens. They just don't sell them. Yeah, they want to control the, it's, whole, the whole thing. It's complicated, though. For instance, Apple says if you jailbreak your phone, it's not just you potentially being impacted if you get hacked. You could then, that phone could then be a problem to sell sites, to the, the, the internet, the public internet. Uh, it's, I think it's, the, the, it, I mean, we're not talking a 1967 VW bug. Yeah. I could <laughs> change the oil, I could do the timing, I could, I could tune it up uh, with my own tools. We're not talking that anymore. The world has gotten much more complex. And all of this stuff interacts with other people's stuff and with the public internet as well. So I think it's gotten complicated. Look, I am in favor of the right to repair. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. And I'm glad that uh, Kelsey Weber from iFixit and everybody at iFixit uh, is, it, you know, they're doing the right thing, teaching people how to fix their stuff, getting parts when they can. And the and screwdriver tool set is fantastic. <laughs> the screwdriver tool set is fantastic. So many anguish. Where the hell's that <laughs> screw? <you know? laughs> so thank you, Kelsey, for joining us from iFixit. Uh, I'm really glad that, Jason, you're doing the great reporting you've been doing at Motherboard about this and every other other subject motherboard.vice.com jason is the editor-in-chief there and we should yeah, point thank you so much for having me my pleasure oh, we, go should, ahead. we should point people to repair.org mm -hmm. that's the group the nonprofit that is fighting yep. in all of these states and and if you want to raise awareness uh both with your state legislature and yourself about all of this, repair.org is a great and, place to go. Yeah, and the EFF is doing a considerable amount on this as well. But Thank you so much, Kelsey and uh, Jason. We appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks yeah, for having me. Really fun. And, and you know, in this modern world, there's no, it's black and white. It's very difficult. Yeah. I, Shades I, of gray. <laughs> I, I, I certainly honor your right, and I be, I'm a believer. If you buy something, that's yours. Mm. You should be able to mess with it, but you don't have the right to do something that's going to then impact other people yeah. over the internet, right? And the tractor thing is tricky because they don't actually own the tractors; they're you know they're, they're leased in. But it just seems madness that if something that's easily fixable breaks and you've got crops rotting in the field, you've got to wait for somebody for yeah. an authorized dealer yeah. to come and fix and it. And if Apple's going to refuse to repair it, yeah, his that, iMac. I know that that grips my muffin because I've just cracked the screen on my Android phone and looking at the repair costs because the parts aren't readily available, it's like, oh, man, it's what it's buying you for. And yet, and it's, it's it absolutely Apple's right to what? A, repair, refuse repair, and B, to say, we're not going to sell parts to third parties. You yeah. have to go to Apple. It's their right, I think. I think it is, and I, th I should imagine that basically if somebody did make, start making screens exactly the same size and shape, they would have a lawsuit coming yeah. their way really quickly. Yeah, I guess I come down on the, on the side of consumers. As Jason pointed out, Apple makes plenty of money. It's not they as though they're short the bubble. They don't say, you know? <laughs> need to screw nice people like Jason because, you know, he, well, he tried to upgrade his RAM instead yeah. of using that expensive Apple RAM. I mean, I, we, we both grew up in the PC era where, the, the, you know, the case on the PC he came off at least two or three times a year. Yeah, and that's tried fun. Cards. Yeah. That's fun. You, taught, you learned a lot about electronics. You learned also about the importance of static straps after frying your first RAM chips. So. And by the way, I have changed my oil on my VW uh -huh. and tuned it up. <laughs> I have. And that was fun, although I'm glad I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I tried to change the oil on my Tesla and nothing happened. Oh, we're going to take uh, <laughs> a few calls for help. <laughs> Injustice. I couldn't understand it. Where's the oil in this thing?